Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians, all will be one to one. I'm delighted to welcome the writer Julie Salomon to the program. A former film critic and reporter with the New York Times, her latest book has a very short title and a very long subtitle with intrinsic drama. Hospital, man, woman, birth, death, infinity, plus red tape, bad behavior, money, God, and diversity on steroids has just been published by the Penguin Press. We'll discuss the dramas that take place on every level at a big city hospital, and specifically Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Your book is basically about a year in the life of Maimonides Hospital in Borough Park, Brooklyn. How did you come to Maimonides and why? I came to Maimonides through a series of circumstances. Um, I had written a book about Maimonides, the the rabbinic scholar from a thousand years ago, and a woman from the hospital decided she wanted to meet me because she thought we had some karmic connection, even though my book had nothing to do with medicine. So I met her, I met another doctor who was about to go out to Maimonides, and um, he had been taking care of a friend of mine who had had cancer, and I found out he was going from St. Vincent's to Maimonides because the hospital was starting a new cancer center. So eventually I went out, and what I discovered at Maimonides was basically a microcosm of America in the 21st century. It was a hospital that was started uh, for the Jewish community of Borough Park a hundred years ago, and now services still that community. It's a kosher hospital, but now 80 percent of the patients come from everywhere. It's 67 languages spoken here. It's a big hospital, and I thought, wow, this could be a very interesting place to see what happens when you bring a lot of people from a lot of backgrounds in life and death situations. Mm -hmm. As you said, it's a very, its clientele is very diverse, but it tends to be dominated by the Orthodox Jewish community, you know, even, even so. I mean, one hospital executive concluded at, point, at, a, at one point, we work for Hatzalah, you know, <laughs> they, which is the, the, uh, the ambulance. Orthodox amb ambulance service. You know, there's kosher food, they're the Orthodox Jewish midwives who come and serve, well, all of the women, any women who need them at the hospital who are pregnant. The uh, mosquitoes, uh, the guys who check the kitchen to make sure that the kosher rules are being enforced. Now, how does this work for everybody else at the hospital? Well, that's what's so fascinating about it, because the community, I mean, the hospital's in Borough Park, which is sort of the heart of the Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Jewish community um, of New York. And yet, because the surrounding neighborhoods are now Pakistani, Mexican, uh, Polish, you know, every kind of background that exists, the hospital administration has had to recognize over the last 15, 20 years that it is a community hospital and the community is changing. Still, the Orthodox community is very strong. 20 to 25 percent is still a pretty big group of patients. Right. And so it's this constant balancing act of respecting the old, honoring the new, disrespecting the old, trying not to disrespect the new. Mm -hmm. And I found it fascinating because it's a, it's a hospital and a neighborhood that's in constant flux, flux. and constant change. Right. And then superimposed on that are the unbelievably rapid changes that have been going on in the healthcare system. So you have these two kind, it's like the plates of an earthquake in a right. way, kind of shifting, right. and the hospital trying not to fall into the cracks. Now you have this, this really impressive and large cast of characters on the administration and medical side. Who are some of the characters who impressed you most? Well, many characters impressed me a great deal, but I would say uh, the hospital president, certainly, who was the person who let me into this hospital for a year without a minder, Pamela Breyer. Mm -hmm. And she's quite an interesting character. She's from Los Angeles originally, but came to New York in her 20s. She uh, came up through the public hospital system here. She was the head of Bellevue for a time in Jacoby up in the Bronx, and then went out to Maimonides as the number two to Stanley Brezhnev uh, about 10 years ago, 13 years ago at this point. And when I came on the scene at Maimonides, she's a tiny woman. She wears Isimayaki clothes. She's not a typical sort of policy wonky kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, she's very small, but she carries a big—her daughter called her a trunk and a twig's body. And two weeks before she had taken over the hospital in 2003, she and her husband were in a devastating car accident. 
that both of them almost died in, and she was still two years later when I came to the hospital suffering the aftermath. And what was fascinating about her was she had both the perspective of a policy person and somebody running a hospital and a patient right. running the hospital. So she was one. Um, another was Douglas Jablon. Ah, uh, Doug. <laughs> Douglas Jablon is the mitzvah man, the good deed man, the fixer. And Jablon is the liaison to all these communities. He's this huge Orthodox Jew. He's 6'2 and gigantic and always looks like he's going to a funeral in a black suit, yarmulke on his head, and he's best friends with the local imam, the priest, the, the a Haitian leader. Everybody is Douglas, the chief of police. I went to Douglas his son's wedding, 1,400 of his closest friends were there, wow. and it was like the United Nations. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. he is a fascinating character. He runs the hospital's patient rep department, where they have 30 people whose sole job is to sort of be the patient advocate. They, they interpret in 67 languages. They do all the kinds of things that maybe the doctors and nurses used to do but don't have time for. Um, another character is Mr. Zen. Uh, well, a, a Chinese patient who's very sick. Very sick, undocumented in, immigrant, came in through the emergency room and stayed for a year. Wow. We'll come back to him. Um, you know, among all of these people, I mean, particularly the, the people who run the hospital and, and, and others as well, you know, you have a lot of egos, you have a lot of agendas, you have a lot of turf battles, um, uh, issues that have to be tiptoed around, uh, which makes it very complex to try to get anything done, right? It does. And I think that's true in any hospital. Hospitals are a little like universities. There's a lot of squabbling for power. There's a lot of squabbling for turf. Money becomes involved, but money is often the way to acquire power. So if you're a surgeon, you want to build up a big a big department for yourself. but Because if you bring in a lot of money, you have power. You have power. Right. And so that's one issue. Um, on the one hand, the hospital's a com pillar of the community. So on the one hand, you want to do outreach to all right. of the various constituencies. But a lot of the things that you have to do to reach those people, social workers, nursing attendants, patient reps, none of that's covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. So it's always another budget right. ballot. And I think there's this constant balance between ego and altruism between trying to be to do the right thing and trying to balance the budget so you can continue doing the right thing and so there's this constant turn it's very exciting actually mm -hmm. what did you think of the quality of the doctors and of the nurses I thought that it was extraordinarily good, extraordinarily good under the circumstances. I felt I was actually surprised at how even in the middle of this hubbub, I mean, this is a hospital that's 95 to 100 percent full all the time. So even just keeping the floors clean, very difficult because there's constant traipsing about by so many people. That was an issue I mean, with, with Pam Breyer. You know, she wanted the hospital to be cleaner and then you had and she kept trying different ways and it was very, and then you had these people, people in one unit of the hospital would steal the mops from the janitors in the other part of the hospital. So even that became a real It is. It's challenge. a constant challenge because um, most hospitals, I mean, you have a few major hospitals in Manhattan and in various centers around the country that have huge endowments. So they have a little money to spare. Most hospitals are more like Maimonides where they're really working at a very thin margin. So they have to watch every dime, and yet they're dealing with millions of dollars. I mean, the budget of Maimonides is, is $850, $900 million a year. It's mm -hmm. like a huge company in a way, but the product is people's health, so right. it's much more precarious. And yes, there is this constant battling. And, and it was sometimes, and I think part of it is there is a lot of stress because of the money issues. Are they understaffed? Everybody's understaffed. Yeah. And they're understaffed a lot because of the insurance requirements now have taken a lot of nurses away from actual nursing. And what they do now is sit behind a computer. Anybody who goes to a hospital, you're thinking, why is that nurse always behind the computer? She's behind the computer, he as well, but mostly she still are behind the computer because they have to figure out how to get the patients out of the hospital. The whole goal of the hospital is to shorten the amount of stay. Right. And to get them out of the hospital, most of the patients aren't ready necessarily to go home or they need aftercare, and they need a nurse, somebody who understands the medical issues, right. to arrange that. But every time you stick a nurse behind a computer, there's one less person off the, on right. the floor. 
Um, for a hospital to make money seems to be a really delicate balance. Uh, you got to do all kinds of you got to you, you got to appease the ambulance company. You got to get private doctors to send their patients to the cancer center. You got to get the number of surgeries up. You got to to uh, build up the number of radiology patients. You got to reduce the average length of stay in the hospital. Somebody in the book said hospitals don't get paid well for giving really good care. They get paid for radiating people, doing complicated surgery, doing chemotherapy. That's absolutely right. I mean, one of the big failings of our system right now, and you see it time and again inside the hospital, is a lot of being a doctor is actually talking to your patients. And when you're under this time crunch to move people through the system, there's less and less time for that. And social workers, very important, especially in a big city hospital, right. especially when you have a lot of people who don't speak English. And those are the first things that get cut when there's a budget cut. And so, I mean, I think anybody will tell you that a lot of healing is not just the medicine it, you take, it's the care you're given. Right. And that becomes the first thing to go out the window. Yeah. One of the... Um Maimonides, in, in the year that you were there, 2003, the hospital had just opened a cancer center. And this, cancer is a disease that, that runs throughout the book. There's so many people who are getting it. A lot of the people on the top administrators have been affected by it. Either they've had it or somebody uh, they're married to or know very well has had it or died from it. And yet, it was interesting, one doctor said, um, we almost never cure cancer of certain forms of cancer. We almost never cure it. We just treat it. And my question was, you know, has cancer treatment become a kind of racket for the medical industry where, you know, you get people get this diagnosis and even though the likelihood is that they're not going to live long, you know, they impose this really painful and difficult, you know, treatment on them only to give them a few more months or a year? What do you think? It's a great question because I think you've touched on the constant dilemma in the medical field, technology versus spirituality versus touch. Every, nobody wants to die. That's the, that's the basic bottom line. Nobody right. wants to get old. Nobody wants to die, even though it still happens, mm -hmm. no matter what you do. And the thing with cancer that's so tricky, I mean, yes, you can say it's true. There are certain cancers that no matter what you do within a two- or three-year period, you're almost 99.9% .9 destined to die. But then you can turn around and say other cancers that 20 or 30 years ago were completely a death sentence now become a chronic illness um, or a complete remission. Right. Breast cancer, there are all kinds of cancers that they've had very good success with. And I think the thing that is constantly making the question so complicated is, well, what if? What if I stay alive four months more than some new treatment will turn this into a chronic disease instead of a fatal disease. And I think that nobody's very good at really laying out the full question right. for people. Right. So that the question you ask may be quite different if you're 35 years old and have two young children, or if you're 60 years old and you've had a good life and do you want to spend the last three years of it sick Suffering. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, it's amazing to me how many people choose the suffering yeah. because tied to the suffering is some kind of hope. And the one thing that I think doctors, nurses, everybody are not very good at are really discussing these things honestly with right. people. Right. We have a take a short break. We'll be back with Julie Salomon, author of Hospital, after the following messages. Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? Oh, this is probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? What, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool, really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this. So why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately. Because time lost is brain lost. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Julie Salomon, author of Hospital, published by the Penguin Press. The question everybody wants to know, why is the wait in the emergency room so long? Well, I have a whole chapter in my book called Safety Nets, and it really deals with that 
impenetrable question because one of the things that I saw at Maimonides, you know, the Hatsola ambulance drivers are fierce advocates for their patients. So they arrive in this extremely overcrowded emergency room. So at first you think, well, there just isn't room in the hospital. But then they send their spies out and they find, well, there is a bed here and there is a bed there and there is a... Why are these beds empty with right. all these people right. out here who may... Why aren't they being admitted? And one of the things I saw as you go through, you know, you follow the trail of tears and think, why don't, why aren't these people immediately transferred in? I think many reasons. One, first of all, overcrowding. The emergency rooms, as we all know from endless reports, the uninsured, people who have no place else to go end up going to the emergency room. Even if you are insured, if it's after 5 o'clock, you go to the emergency room. So it's become sort of the first and last resort place. And then not that many doctors. And not that many doctors. So number one. But number two, even as people uh, you know, are treated and they say, well, this one, this one, this one needs to be admitted into the hospital, what causes the log jam is the fact that even if there are empty beds, they aren't necessarily beds on the right floor in the right circumstances right. that suit this patient. So one of the things they have, not only at Maimonides, but at many major hospitals, is a, a full-time person, again a nurse, doing this instead of something traffic else, who's, who's the traffic cop. She's called the bed manager. And her whole job is to go around the hospital and try to mix and match patient with this disease with bed that can tolerate it up here. And you have to understand, this is a 700-bed hospital, 80,000 people going through the emergency room, 40,000 people sitting, you know, going through the actual hospital, start doing the math and you start understanding, you see gridlock happening in the most horrible way. And again, it goes back to your earlier question about the care, you know, primary care. Primary care doctors could probably take care of a huge percentage of the issues that people go into the emergency room for if they caught a lot of these illnesses earlier on through right. regular checkups. But primary care medicine, you can't earn a living. And I'm not talking about becoming rich. I'm talking about paying the bills for your office. Mm -hmm. And so our whole system is set up to create the traffic jam. Right. Right. So does this, your experience at Maimonides, is it an argument for single-payer universal health care? I think it's an argument for single-payer universal health care, but don't kid yourself. That's only step one. Because what does that do? It adds even more to the logjam because you have more people who come into the system. And yes, it'll clear off some because some people will go to the, to the uh, primary care doctors, which is great. But who are those doctors? They've yeah. already started a kind of universal health care system in Massachusetts. It's not single payer, but one of the things that's happened there is they have more people insured, which is great. Now they can't get an appointment with the doctor in the private in the doctor's offices because there aren't enough doctors to see them. Mm -hmm. So now the emergency rooms may be less crowded, but the doctor offices are impenetrable, and you're still going to have people who can't get in yeah. and they're going to go to the emergency yeah. room. So yeah. I think we have to rethink the whole thing of medical care of how do we, do we have a, you know, me, we have to rethink medical education. It's prohibitive now. You go to medical school and basically by the time you graduate, you've got so many, so many bills from tuition payments that, you know, you're a hundred by the time you can pay them off. And so I think we almost have to say, this is an important profession. It's really more important more important than investment banking. Right, right. So how do we start getting the bright people back into this I mean, and profession? there are countries where the government pays for doctor's education, Well, that's right? what I think they should do and here. And you don't, you don't, and doctors don't earn as much money, but there are more of them, and you know. And it's a more, and it's more stable. Yeah. I think there are a lot of doctors who would be very happy, and nurses for that matter. We shouldn't leave them out of the equation mm -hmm. either. But there's a lot of doctors and nurses who, if they knew that they could have a, a decent income, and not be saddled with these medical bills at the end of medical school or nursing school, that would encourage them to go into the profession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other side, which is a way too long conversation for here, but the whole malpractice scheme has to be, right. has to be revised. Right. Right. There's too much money everywhere. The first question everybody, the first question shouldn't be when you enter the, the emergency, enter the doctor's office is who's your insurer. That shouldn't be the first question. It should be what's wrong with you. But from the patient side, if God forbid something bad happens, it shouldn't be how much money can I make off yeah, of this. Yeah. I and sort of happen to think doc doctors tend to get, we, 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 we uh, allow doctors to make too much money, but that's another question. Well, I, I think everybody, for, for another day. No, I think that's right. And just, 
I know it is for another day, but then go on the line. Pharmaceutical companies, yeah. insurance executives, right. everybody's afraid of regulation. But you know what? Sometimes a, a little regulation it can be a good thing. Yeah. Now, I absolutely hate sh insurance companies. I think they are the devil, the, the root of all evil. I mean, are they, the, are they the, the, the big villains in this whole thing? I think they are. They're the unstated, they're the hovering villains. Because, you know, if you step back, almost every, everything now is governed by insurance. Right. What's reimbursed and what isn't. And in fact, I, I was actually talking to somebody in the health policy field the other day, and she was saying that even just in the last five to ten years, it's an extraordinary difference how any aspect of healthcare you go into, it always is follow the money. Right. It used to be follow the sickness. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, really, that's really, I think, reflective of the society at large. Doctor, uh, not doctor, but the patient, Mr. Zen. Uh, is that an example of the hospital at its best? I think it's a it's a it's an example of the hospital it's a, at its best and maybe the system at its worst. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Zen was uh, an undocumented restaurant worker who came here from China. Probably had a lot of big dreams, and he ended up at 41 years old in the Maimonides emergency room with a giant tumor. Um, he was admitted into the hospital. And much as, you know, not to say the hospital's purely altruistic, they would have much rather have moved him into hospice or take, send him home, but he was not ambulatory. He couldn't walk out mm -hmm. the door. He had to stay. But what happened was he was a very nice man, and he had the luxury, if you can call it that, that most patients don't have, of actually getting to know the people who took care of him. And so... Even though his, he didn't have much English, there were interpreters around, and it was extremely moving to see the nurses, the doctors on that floor who got to know him, and I think genuinely, gen, genuinely got to care for him. And you know, it's a two-way street. As much as patients feel frustrated that they don't get the personal touch, believe me, the doctors and the nurses and even the technicians working on it, they feel the same. They, most of the people who go into this work actually do it because they want to do something meaningful. You know, it gets lost in the shuffle, but I think most people don't go in it for the money, or at least not purely for the mm -hmm. money. And I think it becomes frustrating to everybody because the lack of respect on all sides is very it's very uh, enervating to people. People want to feel that they're doing something good, and they very rarely have the opportunity to have the reward of a thankful patient or right. even to get to know somebody. Mm -hmm. And so with Mr. Zen, even though it was a crazy situation where his hospital bill is going to, I mean, you know, a hospital is not the place to be when you have an uncurable cancer. Right. Um, but, but that's what it was. And and what you saw was, oh, this is what happens when there's a good relationship, and right. people want it. Did your experience at Maimonides make you hopeful or discouraged about the future of health care in this country? Oh, I think, well, I'm sort of a half-glass full person by nature, so I guess it made me hopeful, but hopeful with many, 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 many reservations. Um, hopeful because, as I said, I think what I saw, even in the middle of this insanity, how people really tried to do the right thing, and by and large, they did. I mean, the truth is far, far, far more people go into the hospital and come out better than, than come out screwed, than up. Come out right, screwed right. up. We hear about the screwed up. And the other thing that really struck me was when there's many, you know, we forget, but there are many, many regulatory bodies that oversee hospitals and the medical profession, and they do make things better. Mm -hmm. You know, in the book, they talk about hand washing. You know, there was this, all these reports started coming out four or five or six years ago about how an amazing percentage of medical people did not wash their hands right. all the time. And big efforts have been put into place to monitor that and to get people to wash, I mean, it sounds so basic, but to wash their hands before they enter and when they come out of a patient room. Right. And there have been all these reports coming out recently that actually it's worked. More physicians and, and other medical people are washing their hands and deaths from horrible bacteria mm -hmm. are going down. Mm -hmm. Based on what you learned, if you got sick, would you choose to go to Maimonides? You know, I would. God forbid I don't want to go to any hospital, because I think they're really scary places, even under the best of circumstances. Um, but I thought that the people there, and I do think at Maimonides, as in any hospital, 
you can have bad luck. You can have the tired nurse who's not paying attention or the doctor who's crabby over something and not at the top of his or her game. But by and large, I did think the care was good. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that if I went into any hospital, I would sure want to have somebody as my advocate, either a family member or a friend, because there's a lot to negotiate in a hospital, and you really need to have somebody there as your advocate. Just call Hatsula, Bill. Just call Hatsula, <laughs> yes. I have them in they'll my get, speed dial. Yeah, they'll get you through the emergency room. I actually did put them in my speed dial. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're out of time. I want to thank Julie Salomon for joining us. Hospital, man, woman, birth, death, infinity, plus red tape, bad behavior, money, God, and diversity on steroids has just been published by the Penguin Press. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.